We are in one of the coolest places I've ever been to in the computer industry. It is a gigantic testing lab where almost everything you buy for computers at some point goes through a lab like this one. Or at least if it goes through a different lab, probably they bought equipment from this place. This is Lonwen. We're in Taiwan. They made the fan tester that we have back at home base. They make dummy heaters. We're going to be looking at a supersonic chamber. We'll also be looking at flow chambers that are flanking me here. They have massive wind tunnels all over the place. Really cool equipment. So we're going to do a walkthrough today and see how computer parts are truly designed and engineered at the deepest levels. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and their new Series 500TG ARGB mid-tower case. The Thermaltake series case is perforated all on the front panel and the power supply shroud, including perforations on the cable side of the case for further ventilation to the PSU and hard drive chamber of the case. A separate access door for hard drives makes the case easy to work with for 3.5 inch storage, or the door can be swapped out for a separate LCD panel kit that displays system information. Other features include a GPU support kit, vertical mounting, and a hinged glass panel. Learn more at the link in the description below. So one of the more interesting machines we came across is for altitude testing, where this helps test the efficacy of cooling products at different altitudes. It's actually running right now, so I'm not going to keep it open for too long. But this keeps the, you can see in there, there's a knock to a fan with a cooler mounted on top of a dummy heater. At the far end behind me is where the thermals are controlled for the test. Let's get this closed again so we don't interrupt their test for too long. And what this does is evaluates things like for data center, for example, where, or maybe laptops, ruggedized notebooks, things like that, that would be deployed in places where you might have a high altitude or an extremely low altitude. Because one of the challenges with cooling is that the same fan revolution at a higher altitude is less effective than it is at a lower altitude. But then you also have the complexity of the air temperature changing so ambient temperatures lower at the higher altitude, making it extremely difficult to test accurately. So Longwind engineered this to help do that evaluation. I mean, you saw in there, there's a knock to a fan right now running consumer products, but they might also look at multi-U racks of server components if they need to see how it'll do maybe underground or very high above ground, depending on what that component is designed to do. So this is all for altitude versus barometric pressure testing. Okay, so the next one is this giant wind tunnel. This, it's about eight or nine meters long. We don't have an exact measurement. Very long though, so it goes all the way over there and actually the wind ends up exiting the building. So there is a massive metal duct attached to the side of the building on the inside here. All the air goes out that way. The actual wind generation happens down there, but it originates from here and flows out towards the end of the building. This isn't currently hooked up right now, but this would show the millimeters of aqua or the pressure if it were it's actually, you can see it's all fully analog with just water levels for measuring uh, normally millimeters aqua for that. And then over here, there's a lift and drag measurement that spits out on this screen down here, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, this is easy enough to operate that I'm going to be able to operate it with exactly one second of training. It's impressive, I know. Not many people can do what I do. Let me show you exactly how quickly I learn. This dial turns to the right and then the wind goes. I'm an expert now. Uh, so, so this, you can see that we're actually, it, this is a pressure measurement. So you got millimeters of aqua here. It's got this, I like this phrasing, attack angle. Uh, and then all I've done is adjust the speed to the right. I don't know how much comes through on camera, but there's a low frequency hum now and you can hear the air flowing through. So you can place the device under test in the center here. Actually, if we get a close up on this, foil, you'll see that it actually uh, vibrates and wobbles a little bit as the air comes through it. It's 274 gram foil in there right now. And this would be where you might test like scale models of vehicles. Uh, you wouldn't use this for computer components necessarily, but for all kinds of other stuff like plane parts, airfoils, car parts, you might test that in here. So if you're into spoilers for your vehicle, send it to Lawnwind. They'll tell you if it actually does anything. Uh, let's walk over here though. So this is for fundamental study of a concept for how something might work in that chamber. But then over here, sorry, Mike, there's a practical application. This would be more the computer component stuff where Corsair actually has one of these for custom water cooling part testing where this whole thing hooks up 
as basically a, the Corsair engineer described it to me as an engineer's playground to design water cooling parts. So typically they'll have a couple of dummy heaters here as well where they can heat the components. Uh, for, so like water blocks, for example, and do different heat loads. You can test different micro fin densities. You could test for head pressure at the fins in the cold plate, or you might test for flow as it, it comes out or enters the cold plate. So this would be very useful for something like that where you're engineering a different design of your water block, whether internally or you're talking about components further down the line. For example, how much might a quick disconnect fitting impede the flow? What's your drop and flow before uh, versus after that QDC? So that's where the more practical application comes in. Let's check out another machine. Heat pipe performance measurement testing is what's done on this machine. And they have a couple of examples here for different types of heat pipes. Uh, so uh, this, if I remember correctly, this is the sintered copper one. Kemba Dondon ones is, so you can correct me in the comments. But this is a copper sintered heat pipe, so that'll be your standard used in most air coolers these days and, and uh, video card coolers. Then there's just a steel rod, there's an aluminum rod. One of these is just a straight copper rod. And this is just an example of what might end up being tested in this machine, because ultimately they're looking at things like the wick structure. So inside of the heat pipe, is it sintered, is it weave, is it groove, or is it a composite of those materials? Those are your standard heat pipe choices when you're designing a heat pipe for an air cooler. And here they have a test rod that's mounted through a test fixture. So this clear acrylic sheet on the end here, this uh, clamp, they've got a clamp down mechanism here where you can dial the force and we'll move the camera over this way. This shows your kilograms of force for the clamp down mechanisms. There's two of them. That's useful for keeping the test consistent between the heat pipes. Uh, you might also use it for other types of testing, but I'm not too familiar with all the details. There, there was a lot to know here. For what's actually being tested, there's a dummy heater. So this is creating a heat load. No, you pump a certain amount of known watts into it to generate heat. It goes into this plate, and then the clamp down area is fitted with multiple thermocouples. So all these tiny clear wires here, these are thermocouples, and that's what these blue housings are here. So these run to the machine to a thermocouple reader and logger. And what ends up happening is they take multiple points, I think it's three currently, it looks like it could actually be up to five, across the heat pipe service, they average them. And then that tells them how effective is a particular heat pipe. So it's really cool because instead of looking at the entirety of the cooler, which is what we do in our testing, they're looking at individual parts so that as you're designing the cooler, you can make the right decisions for is it actually worth increasing the cost to change the heat pipe to something composite rather than strictly centered or something along those lines? So that's what this machine is. Uh, really interesting here, you can also rotate the test platform. So this, for example, will slowly rotate. So if you wanted to do testing with it at a different angle, you would be able to do that in a, an extremely controlled and precise way. And the reason you might do this is because the heat pipe efficacy, just like vapor chambers, changes at different angles. So it's the most effective when the heat source is at the bottom, flat like this, like this actually, and then the heat pipe is vertical because gravity actually has some effect here and assists the cooling performance. So if you were to flip it over, it would actually be the worst where the heat source is at the top and the heat pipe is coming down because internally there's a little bit of liquid that has an evaporator and a condenser end where it will evaporate at the hot end, it'll condense at the cold end, that's how they work. This is another piece of testing for heat pipes. This is actually a response time tester. So what they do is they socket the heat pipe right here vertically where this thermocouple reader is coming in and then apply a heat load and up here, we have a graph we can show where uh, this bottom x-axis, that's time. This is temperature. And what we're looking at is the response time for how much does the heat pipe heat up over the test period. So the blue line at the bottom here is the ambient temperature. Uh, I don't know exactly which each of these materials is, but what they're showing is a sintered copper pipe as the best versus I think one of these is just a steel and one's just aluminum, not a pure, not an actual heat pipe. So that's what this does. Super cool engineering stuff. Let's move on to the vapor chamber. So for vapor chambers, there's two solutions here. They have an ultra thin vapor chamber tester. This one's really interesting, it's brand new. This is used for vapor chambers that look like these. Look at how tiny this is. Uh, some of the larger ones, they're 0.1 to 0.4 millimeters, depending on what you're talking about. 
That's the larger ones. And what they're testing is basically the efficacy of this type of tiny vapor chamber for something like a phone, for example, some small electronic device. We'll come back to that because that's really, it's very complicated, it's very cool. This one is more traditional. So what they're testing here is the same type of vapor chamber you might find on a video card or a computer a hardware component, maybe like a server cooling solution. I've gotten thermal paste on, it's, it's everywhere. It's in our lab too. And they clamp down this mechanism. So currently it's applying a heat load. You can see here we've got 22.5 or so volts in, 1.8 amps out, multiplying you get the watts. And over here we have temperature readouts with all the thermal couples running down. You can say they've got heating turned on, the whole thing is system power on, software on a computer down here. And all of this hooks up to currently a manually controllable uh, clamp that clamps the vapor chamber down to a heat source. So this is a dummy heater. All the heat is coming from here, from power input. We just looked at the benchtop power supply, 1.8 by 22, and it heats up this sort of ball down here, this plate, into the vapor chamber. Then they use this plate as a bracket to support the vapor chamber so it doesn't bend. So there's all these small variables they have to think about when testing these things. Up here, this is a cold plate. That's part of the test apparatus. So this is designed to circulate water. They have two tubes going out, so two outlets, one inlet for water. That's these three hoses on the back side. And what this is designed to do specifically is have extremely even cooling across the surface of the cold plate so that for testing purposes, they can then look at the performance of the vapor chamber. And we have uh, Joseph who basically designed everything here or most of it uh, and runs the company. He, ex he drew a diagram for us on top of the vapor chamber and showed how they use five thermal sensors in here, T-couples, to test in five different mostly equidistant points to see what is the speed of that temperature spread across the surface of the vapor chamber and is it even. So it helps to determine is the vapor chamber design actually good. And I'm gonna kill the power on this one briefly and we'll just show you how it lifts up. So here we can lift up the vapor chamber and secure it into place. So this whole thing is what clamps down and up in here, there's five thermal sensors that actually depress as the vapor chamber makes contact with them so that they seat evenly into the cold plate. This allows them to know exactly how much heat is coming from the source down here. We'll pull this off. It's still, it's still warm to show you. And then how much cooling is up here. So uh, they have an accept and a reject system basically to look at the overall performance of it and then there's foam to isolate from the bracket so that there's no influence on the cooling or on the performance testing from this bracket itself. So we're gonna leave this here for a moment and then move on to the ultra thin vapor chamber. This one's actually even more interesting. So this is a new design. They have a published a journal on how this works to test for cooling because phone design is still advancing. So these are the vapor chambers. This is the retention apparatus so the actual mechanism that they mount the vapor chamber in. So one of these tiny things, like this is one of the thicker ones actually, would sock it into a specially designed fixture. And what they're trying to do is reduce any clamping tension at all. So the one behind me for the larger vapor chambers has clamping force. So there's direct pressure applied above and below the vapor chamber. These phone ones, they can't withstand that force. They would break or it'd be risky. So instead, they clamp around it to get an even and very low distribution just to hold it in place. And then for measurement, because you can't use a, a, a dummy heater with a measurement device clamping down on top of it, you have to invent a new solution. And the solution for contactless thermal generate for heat generation of the source is a laser. And what they're doing is at this, this silver line here, this is for a laser. So over on this side, a laser is fed in, it's piped into the chamber, and then in here, uh, where this silver hose comes up, it shoots the laser into the bottom of a prism. So there's a little triangular shape down here, it's got a 45 or so. It then diverts 5% of the laser this way, and they use that to measure what is the laser power and effectively the heat going into the vapor chamber. So these vapor chambers can take, uh, they're designed for about four to eight watts for cell phones, and the laser is capable of up to 10 watts. 
So they shoot 95% of the laser's power into the vapor chamber. They redirect 5% to do the measurement. Hey, are we applying the right amount of power to the vapor chamber? And then for the rest of it, this is air. So air circulates in and out right here. And down here is where the air jet, I guess you could call it, is situated. So all of this is where just those two tiny tubes relative to this size uh, it all circulates back through here so they can generate and measure the amount of cooling that they are applying to the vapor chamber. And then on the heating side, what they're doing is using two IR thermometers because, again, you can't use thermocouples here because you can't get that clamping force without risking damaging the device under test. So they use IR thermometers to shoot down into the surface of the vapor chamber, take a measurement, and then that's how it works. So really cool very interesting way to, and creative way to look at and measure something that can't take a lot of clamping force. And this one, they'll also do rotational tests because you don't know how a phone user is going to be holding their phone. It will be in all different angles. So that's one of the other tests they apply. Let's, let's, let's go look at, I, I asked, by the way, just some background story. I asked, how does this work? And then this happened. Heating power. Right. So we can So that took like 20, 30 minutes to figure out. I think I've conveyed most of it to you all. Let's move on to the next machine. Okay, now it's time to do some thermal testing. So this, this is cool. This is thermal interface testing. All of these are for thermal paste, thermal pads, things like that, where you're, you're serving some sort of intermediary purpose to get the heat from point A to point B and test its efficacy in that process. So. The things they would look at for this would be wasp meter Kelvin. You can also just look at the absolute temperature uh, or relative. So you could use it comparatively, but one of the other primary use cases would just be to determine in an absolute sense, how good is the interface that as a company you've chosen to use to cool your device under, under load, whatever, whether that's an SOC or CPU or whatever. So you could use this for testing uh, CPU thermal paste, CPU thermal paste. It applies a heat load down here. So, there's again, a kind of an acceptor jack system where heat loads here, you're doing the cooling up here. There's a thermal coupled mount. And uh, I, I, don't think the, I don't think the napkin is included. And then uh, this is pneumatically operated. The one next to it right there is operated by motor. So we're gonna look at that as well. There are benefits to each of them, but the motor one is primarily beneficial because you can more accurately control the amount of contact force and the, the displacement of the interface. So when you're testing, this has a thermal pad on it right now. I'll show you, uh, we'll get a, I think I'm doing this right. Once again, I've received about five seconds of training on this one. So um, looking at a world-class expert, watch this. Is it working? It better be working. <clears throat> okay, so it comes up like that. Right now there's a thermal pad under there. If you were to put paste under there, the problem with paste is it doesn't apply the same way every time. So we're gonna lower this one back down in a second and I'll show you why the motor option is more useful for pace. These are sensors where this helps to tell the operator, the technician, how much, uh, well, it, how thick the interface is being tested. And if you look over here, actually, I'll show you the actuation of that number. Let's find which one that is. Right there, thickness two. So this, if I press it all the way down, we get a minus three uh, from some baseline known zero. We push a different one, that one moves. So that helps to tell us the thickness of the interface on our test. So lower it back down, close the door and go check out the one next to it right here. So this is the newer model that's motor operated for the thermal resistance and conductivity measurement. Uh, so for this one, where's the... Where's the, oh, there it is, it uses a mouse, that's right. So for this one, if we wanna raise the apparatus, I'm gonna click this button right here. And it's now using a motor, where if you look at the contact force here, you're gonna see that number change. So I'm holding down the minus sign, it's reducing the contact force, you've got the kilograms of force, and this device is actually raising at the moment, so it's going back up. Uh, which is what you would do to reset the text fixture. And then you can bring it back down with a plus sign to put it back under test. So 
This allows you to see how much pressure you're applying, but also there's tools to measure the displacement of the interface uh, underneath because again with paste, it's not the same every time. A couple other tools in this room that are really cool. So thermal chambers, there's a lot of them. Thermal chambers have interesting uses where one of the things we learned over time was that just having a thermal chamber does not inherently make your thermal testing better. In fact, for a lot of computer testing, it's almost better to use a room that just has a really controlled AC where it's either always on or always off, but the same temperature steady and <clears throat> go that route for testing thermals rather than necessarily having a chamber. Where chambers come into play is for specific use cases or if you want to really control the temperature at a higher or a lower than ambient level. So for example, this particular chamber can go up, it has some certain protections in it, because this one can go up to 150 degrees. So that would be useful if you wanted to bring it up, maybe to test a laptop, like this ThinkPad that's in here right now, in say an environment where you have no AC, maybe it's it might be a ruggedized notebook that the military uses or something, you would need to test how would it perform in a desert environment, for example. And then on the opposite side, on the really cold side, maybe how it does in the Arctic, if it's gonna be for science and research. So that's where these chambers really come into play, is dialing the temperature down or up for those targeted use cases. So this one has a VR test fixture in it right now, where there's a dummy head in there, they have all these thermocouples, and what they do is, they wire it up. There's actually a couple hanging uh, temperature, thermal probes in here, thermometers, right now. So there's one there, one there. That tells you the ambient temperature before I opened it, it was about 21, 22 degrees. So I control this one at a sort of normal room temperature, maybe for a US household, for example, uh, with AC. The dummy head is all probed up, like in the eyes and the ears around where the mask would fit for uh, the VR headset and what they're testing for is sort of breathability. How hot does that device get? And what is the skin temperature for the user as a result? You would also do this with a laptop where you might put a laptop here, probe it up and use that to tell you what is the surface temperature, the skin temperature of a laptop because there are certain government safety specs you have to hit for skin temperature of an electronic device that's contacting the user. And then down here, we have a pretty cool thermal chamber for testing phones. Uh, in this particular instance. So there's an IR camera up top. It's pointed straight down. We've got a read of sort of the screen right now. They've adjusted for emissivity and reflectivity, of course, all that stuff. And what it does is you can adjust the rotation. There's a clockwise and counterclockwise button right here. And you can spin this thing on these giant cogs on the sides so that it can rotate and you can get an IR image of different angles of the phone. Now, these chambers specifically are designed so that there's no airflow, which is the important aspect of it. There's a couple types of chambers. One of them has active airflow. Another one has no airflow at all. And the problem with having airflow in a chamber potentially is that it could influence the result of the product under test if you're force feeding it air from a specific area. So the Corsair 1, when we talked to Corsair's thermal engineer, he said having that box in a chamber with bottom fed air was actually worse than testing it in room ambient because the chamber itself was affecting the results in an unrealistic way. Whereas with something like this, where there's no airflow, you're able to get a true, purer look at the performance of it. And uh, that kind of recaps the chambers. There's another one here that's hooked up to uh, a tablet or a convertible or a screen, something along those lines. And otherwise, this, this place is just filled with thermal interface testing. So let's move on to maybe x-rays and SEM, something like that. This area has a lot of background noise. Sorry, we're doing our best. This is super cool though. So this is a demonstration of flow and it's primarily used for study of fundamentals. So not necessarily product testing, but instead looking at how does the liquid interact with, in this instance, a cylinder that obstructs it as they feed water through, or actually technically it's glycerin through to demonstrate the fundamentals of flow. And actually uh, Joseph, the owner here, has spent three years now, he said, writing a book on flow and using this machine for the educational purposes of demonstrating it all. So this will come out in English as well. Uh, and I th think he said it's gonna be, uh, I, I guess the translation will be more or less public domain. So once it's out, we'll let you all know because it looks pretty cool. This was an inspiration for him. This was published by Stanford. Uh, the editor took a collection of images demonstrating flow characteristics and mechanics several decades ago 
And so that is what he's recreating here. Now, as for how it works, so the glycerin flows through. There's a laser here that's adjustable. We've increased the brightness right now. It can also rotate. I'm gonna try and do that safely here. So this can rotate like that. Uh, they use the laser and they use sensors internally in this giant machine to detect the velocity of the flow and to measure the behavior of the liquid within. Down here, you see some massive, uh, like, motors, I guess. So I, I don't know how close I can get to this thing because there's a laser receptacle there, but massive motors down here. Uh, these are all heavily insulated tubes. This is heavily insulated. So this isn't metal. This is like foam around metal. I'm not sure the precise purpose for all of it. And uh, in any event, all the water originates from here, flows through this way, and then they're able to demonstrate and present some numbers for some basics of fluid dynamics. Pretty cool stuff. Not for products, but not everything has to be for product manufacturing. Let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so now we're in front of an x-ray machine that they use for validation. So this is pretty cool because on this screen, there's a heat pipe right now where we can see some of the inner walls of the heat pipe. It's a much more sophisticated way to look at the construction of a heat pipe than when we cut one in half before. And over on this screen, I have help from Achang, who works at uh, Longlin, who is going to move some of the blue and red lines around a little bit. So uh, right now, he's adjusting the post x-ray file, which this, these files are about 20 gigabytes on their own, to look at the mesh. So like this here, you can see some of the mesh material. These are columns. And then this uh, is also a column. So you can see uh, the columns from two different angles. I don't know what happened here, but uh, so pretty cool where internally you can get the view of the structure. And for validation testing, this is important because if you're buying from a supplier to manufacture your product, you want to make sure the supplier is selling you what you think you're buying. You want to make sure no one's lying to you about your product. And then if you are in validation, one of the things you look for is make sure the product meets the expectations and the marketing. So this is something like, for example, with Deepcool, when we cut their heat pipe in half, it's the type of tool that you could send your product out to a validation lab, say maybe one out of every 10,000 units or whatever, and make sure it, it's, it's representative of the advertising. Uh, as for the cost, I was a little curious. I asked how much these machines are. Uh, slight misunderstanding with my Chinese for a second. I thought he said, I thought he was saying 80,000. He said 800,000 US dollars, very expensive, so, uh, but extremely useful because this type of thing, we have some shots internally, but the actual device under test can be rotated internally on this platform and it keeps a, a distance from the x-ray where if you need to move it closer or farther to see different depths into the product, you can do it all through software. Uh, it's, it's really cool stuff. This is the type of thing that if we ever had the money for it, I would love to have because uh, it's exactly what you saw for our 12 volt high power testing where you can get a close look for failure analysis, especially. So very useful for all of that. As for practical uses, so uh, they have this video here. This is, this is crazy to see the inside of a heat pipe. So this structure, uh, you're gonna be able to see some mesh in here and also a spring, which you can see the coils right here. So there's a spring. Uh, there's also grooves, is that right? Is that the, so the outer side here is the grooves for the heat pipe internal structure. There's the mesh, which is useful for uh, wicking. And the spring is useful for preventing crushing force. So all of this is produced from the x-ray. So when you have, when you look at your $30 Hyper 212 or something, uh, although that one isn't grooved, it's centered, this is the type of thing that goes into a CPU heat sink that's in your computer. So it's not, just a, it's not just a metal pipe. There's actual engineering into it. And we have a video on how heat pipes are made as well, if you want to check that one out. Closing out here, first of all, let's take a look at this. This brings us back to the beginning of this video. You might remember the smaller one of these where I pushed the lever up, it opened the door, and it was for altitude testing. It had the Noctua fan on it. Well, this could support the biggest Noctua fan on Earth if they made one this large. I asked, is it troublesome to open this? And the answer was, yes. Yes, it is. So we're not opening it. But it's just a giant version of the same chamber we saw earlier. 
pretty damn cool. I, I guess you would use it for server type hardware. Uh, there's a bunch of servers in this room, which is why it's kind of noisy. But this is all environment chambers. So they have humidity ranges like 50 to 80% adjustable range. Uh, for temperature, it's adjustable 15 to 60 degrees Celsius. And then it can fit three racks in it. They've built their own dummy racks. We can't show them, but they have heaters in them, dummy heaters. So then they can test the entirety of a server cooling solution for server companies, for web companies, things of that nature. Uh, it's based, it is literally actually a walk-in environmental control chamber, thermal chamber. So really cool stuff out here. But there's an obscene amount more that we can look at and it includes their factory. They build it all here in Taiwan in these buildings that we're in today. So it's not only designed and engineered here, it's built here. And as for all this equipment, all the stuff that's built by them, except for the x-ray we looked at and the SEM, I asked how many engineers, the answer was 10. So extremely efficient operation. And uh, the whole company is about 60 people. And uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible what they can do. This is one of those, it's, it's basically a don't lie about your components because a company like Lawn One will figure it out or if not them, a lab that they sell the validation tools to. We'll figure it out. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly. And we'll see you all next time.